Vitaiche, or welcome. This is Ted the Talking Stamp Collector with another episode of Ted Talk Stamps. And this episode, I have another swap and research challenge. This time with Maciej, or uh, Matthew, for you English speakers, of the Polish YouTube uh, philatelic channel, Ładne Znaczki, or Nice, uh, Pretty Stamps. If you're not familiar with the concept, each of us will send the other a stamp to research. We will mail it off on the same day, which is today, March 21st, and we will film ourselves mailing it out. We'll film ourselves receiving it and showing what we have, and then filming a segment where we uh, go over what we found out about that stamp. And the stamp I'm sending Maciej today is this one. This is actually a gutter pair. It is from uh, the French Antarctic Territory, and it depicts the Challenger uh, Antarctic Expedition Ship. And I would like Matthew to research this stamp, research the subject, find out about this Antarctic expedition and report back to us. So I'm going to pack this up now and take it down to the post office and you're welcome to come along. Oh, that's okay. Wait, I'll just like set up the All right, go ahead. <laughs> Fight. <laughs> Ready for your cookie? Oh, okay. All right, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's your receipt. Okay, so I got Maciej's um, stamps from Poland today, and I've also got a new letter opener. So let's see what I got to research. Stay there? Okay. <laughs> All right, we got it. So here's what we got. Some Watna Znaczki stickers. Five of them. Got a postcard showing the royal castle in Warsaw. For research, for me, I have a selection of Polish stamps. You got this horse set, and various and sundry sets here. Oops, what's this one? Chopin. Ah, from the royalty set. And of course, Copernicus. The bicycle race. And what looks like a series of medieval castles. Set of insects. And for my research project, got this souvenir sheet or miniature sheet picturing Ignacego Bukasiewska. Oh boy, my Polish is so good, isn't it? So I've never seen this sheet or heard of this man before. So, I will research him, 
find out what's going on here. I don't know what that, uh, what them gadgets and machinery are in the background. This is some kind of prototype of a lamp and I have no idea of this thing. So I will find out for you and I'll get back with you. So this is what I found out. The man on this souvenir sheet is Ignacy Lukashevitz. And this is a brand new uh, issue from 2022. And that's because 2022 marks the birth bicentenary of Lukashevitz. And the sheet uh, depicts two of his most noted accomplishments which I will get to in the rest of this video. So first, let's start at the beginning. As I said, he was born in 1822 in uh, the kingdom of Galicia, which at that time belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, in 1822, Poland did not exist as a independent, a, uh, as an independent political entity. It, didn't exist. It, it had been partitioned by Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Now Lukashevitz entered school at the age of 10 and he was noted for being an excellent student. However, at the age of 14 his father died and he was forced to drop out of school in order to support his family. And he found a job as a trainee at a pharmacy where he learned about medicine, botany, and chemical analysis. After four years at this job, he was able to pass a professional exam and to become an assistant pharmacist, whereas Boss characterized him as being a kind man and extremely hardworking. However, there was a movement going on at that time to, to uh, restore Poland's independence. And many of the members of this movement would gather at his pharmacy because it wasn't unusual to have people going in and out. So it was a convenient spot for people to meet. Although this led to him getting arrested by the Austrian police and he went to jail for two years. He was finally released because they couldn't find conclusive uh, evidence that he was part of the plot in the insurgency against Austria. But now he had to go out and find a job again and it took him eight months until he found another job as an assistant pharmacist at the pharmacy of Peter Mikolaj. Now this was one of the great pharmacies in the region and it had a well-equipped laboratory for chemical analysis and things were going well for him. And in 1850, he took a two year hiatus from his job at the pharmacy in order to go back to university. And he graduated with a degree in pharmacy at which time he went back to work at the Mikolaj Pharmacy. One day in 1852, the owner, Peter Mikolaj, he bought 100 kilograms of oil, petroleum oil from the ground, you know, and he brought it back to his pharmacy and gave it to uh, Lukashevitz and a co-worker and told him to analyze it, see what you can do with it. Now at this particular time, oil had been known for a long time. It was, it was seep oil that, just like the name implies, it seeps up from uh, underneath the earth and it forms pools. And you might be familiar with the La Brea tar pits. This is a big uh, pit of seep oil. This oil though had limited commercial use. It, its main use was as using as waterproof on uh, wooden roofs for animal drugs. <laughs> it's a dog's life, isn't it? And as a machinery lubricant. Now from their analysis, Lukashevitz and his co-worker Jan Zay developed a uh, product that uh, was to be used as a skin ointment, except the problem was it was way too expensive and it wasn't a commercial success at all. So they went back to work and they were able to distill the oil into a clear flammable liquid uh, 
which became known as kerosene. And this was the first time this had been done. Lukashevitz got a local tinsmith to design a lamp from which in which to burn this oil. And this non-postal label on the souvenir sheet shows the prototype of his kerosene lamp. Now the light emitted by the kerosene lamp wasn't much brighter than the existing oil burning lamps that they had which used uh, whale oil, animal lard, and uh, maybe other vegetable oils that they burned. But the thing was all these oils were far too expensive. The kerosene was a lot cheaper and allowed for widespread use even among the poorest people. The kerosene lamp became very popular and it even replaced the street lamps and in 1853 the first kerosene street lamp was installed. And in fact kerosene street lamps quickly spread throughout Europe. In that same year Lukashevitz was told of a large oil seep in a nearby town. There was so much oil seeping out that Lukashevitz created the first oil mine as they called it then. This oil mine consisted of digging a trench about a uh, hundred meters long about the size of a football field and 1.2 meters deep and this uh, would collect all the oil seeping out and so much oil was collected from this seep that Lukashevitz built a refinery to process it and this was the world's first oil refinery. Besides kerosene it also processed uh, lubricating oil for machinery and asphalt for paving. Now the demand for oil grew so quickly that the seeps didn't even produce enough. So now instead of waiting for the oil to come to them they went to the oil. They gra grabbed shovels and started digging and this was the beginning of the first oil well. Now it quickly became apparent that men with shovels just wasn't going to you know cut the mustard. And the next step was to create a mechanical drill that could create these shafts quicker, uh, more safely, and more importantly deeper. And this drilling machine is depicted on the other non-postal label on this souvenir sheet. This was a percussive drill that worked by attaching a long heavy rod on one end of a cantilever while workers pulled up and down on the other end of the cantilever pounding and crushing the rock in the shaft with the heavy rod. With this rig they were able to drill down up to one meter a day. Man, work your fingers to the bone, what do you get? Bony fingers. But in the 1860s steam engines were the thing and they were able to rig up a steam engine to uh, to do that with a cantilever. <laughs> uh, advantage of course being that the machine was much stronger than a couple of men on the end of the cantilever. It was able to pound much harder. It could hold a heavier rod and and crush the rock harder and go deeper than a man could. And this sped up the process. They were able to eke out two meters a day. Compare that to today's rigs that can drill 10 meters in an hour. And as you can expect, this oil business made Lukashevitz a very wealthy man. And he was very generous and, as mentioned earlier, kind-hearted. He paid his workers generously and he even set up an insurance program for them, providing for uh, health care, for things like uh, relief for if their house burned down, and even provided a widow's pension for workers who died. He engaged in many philanthropical activities. He, he provided funding for the building of schools, for bridges and roads and hospitals. And he even offered helpful advice to competing business owners uh, in the oil business, all in the interest of facilitating the growth of the oil business in the region. 
Today, Ignacy Lukashevsky is remembered not only for his pioneering work in the oil industry, but also as a kind and generous man who helped out the lives of countless numbers of people. And when he died at the age of 59 of pneumonia, his funeral was attended by 4,000 people. And that, as Lawrence Fisher might say, is the story behind the stamp. So before I sign off from this episode now, I would like to share another viewer top 10 list. And this one comes from GX Jupiter Larson, who has three major topicals that he collects, space, art, and literature. Stick around and I'll have a slideshow of his top 10. And don't forget, if you are not a subscriber, to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you can be notified of future episodes as they go up. Also, to see Matthew's uh, swap and research video for the stamp that I sent him to research, I've included a link in the description below. So at the end of this episode, go ahead and give his channel a visit and watch his video. So until next time, this is Ted the Talking Stamp Collector, wishing you all happy stamping.